All right, today is November 10th. This is a meeting of the, uh, for the record, a, a meeting of the lab testing and product safety subcommittee. Um, in the room here, we have myself, Kyle Harris from the Cannabis Control Board and Nellie Marble from the Cannabis Control Board, and we have two members of the public. On the phone, we have Kim Watson, Carrie Jaguer, and Sherman Hom. Who I think is, we actually have three, but one of them stepped uh, out. Three members of the public, excuse me, and Sherman Hom, an expert in this field that has been invited to um, participate in this meeting. From what, where are you, Sherman? Are you in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, or sorry, New Jersey? Uh, right, um, medicinal genomics is based in Massachusetts, and um, I'm based out of New Jersey. New Jersey, working okay. remotely. Fantastic. Well, um, I just wanted to give some some table setting. Carrie, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind giving us an update on on what you sent Kim the other day and, and how we can um, hopefully move forward after we have a conversation. Yep. Um, okay. Very good. Um, thanks, Kyle. I didn't um, send Kim anything additional beyond what we talked about originally. It just is sort of on paper, and that was uh, using the framework that the under Title VI, the Canvas Quality Control Program lays out what is to be tested for for hemp. Um, the levels would be established in rule and not statute. And using what was all already in statute for the hemp, for hemp, the Canvas Quality Control Program, and also incorporating the uh, standard operating procedures that, that Kim had developed for Oregon uh, for sampling. So the sampling protocol and criteria that Kim developed, um, coupled with um, the Canvas Quality Control Program as laid out in statute and in the hemp rules for what gets tested and when. And additionally, um, appreciate uh, Sherman's input on actually actual levels of um, action, action level, meaningful action levels, I guess is what I mean to say there. Um, and I believe we should make a recommendation that those levels are incorporated in rule, but not in statute. So I think the the level should be set by procedure, so the control board can modify and change them as new research comes to light. So I went through all the guidance that you sent, the tables, basically. Yeah. And so these tables, as I understand, you want to adapt them for cannabis. Correct. Yes? Yeah. Okay. And then, um, so some of the language will all change. And I do have a couple of questions. So um, I noticed which is interesting in your note four under table one, you do have, please apply the standards articulated in the Vermont Hemp Program for potency compliance. And you do talk of a COA, which we talked about last time, mm -hmm. you know, as being, were you planning on doing any type of database for reporting of these, like people sending in their tests or were you going to, or did they just do it by paper right now? Right now it is by paper, but under um, the proposal that Trace presented to us, Trace would use a QR code on a product and all those test results would be available to the public, but, but um, I didn't want to imply that the control board should use the system that they were we want to force one direction as far as database goes right right but yeah. some kind of qr code system yeah. Yeah. to for so the um the uh registrant could upload that s test to whatever you're going to store it in or do whatever okay yeah, that, that's the yeah. that's the plan 
gold um, standard there, yep. So the action limits too that you have presented in table seven, have have any of the labs had a problem meeting the I guess um, that level? Because I noticed you're a lot lower than some other states or some other on the pesticide table. And then it, but again, it's only those, um, do you have any known use of dimethoate or carboforan in the state? That, no. Okay. No. Because no. I was wondering what limited you to that list. Um, knowledge of what does get used. Okay. In, the state sort of we are involved in the uh, licensing and registration of the applicators for the current dispensaries and you know carbofuran nobody's going to use that as furidan um, there isn't any even sold in the state basically um, it, the, the list I think that you see other states use, especially the West Coast states, you see a lot of older chemistry because I think a lot of unregistered chemistry is still coming up from south of the border. Um, we don't really see that here. Folks are trying to use, as, light, as a general rule, as light a chemistry as possible, trying to be as organic as possible. Um, my concern is that maybe some of the traditional fungicide chemistry gets used, so you'll see that those maintain on, uh, on there. But we did adopt that list from other states, and it's not as long as... Um, yeah, no, I know, um, and I would have to look at the fungicide names. I don't know, maybe Sherman knows some of them. <laughs> Um, one of the ones that seems to be used, I'm not a pesticide expert, but one of the products that are is used a lot is Eagle 20. Yeah. That has Michael, you know. So yeah. You, you have that on the list, right? Yes. Right. Yeah. And and I, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a notation to send you the list of approximately 25 pesticides that were detected by, you know, some laboratory testing cannabis products in the United States that were found in marketed products. So you can just okay, you so take see, a look at it. it. You know, I'm not saying that it's going to be used in Vermont, but to be right. aware of it, 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 and that one of the biggest problems as both of well, everyone knows is the um, the uh, mold, yeah. you know, growing on cannabis because of the high temperatures and um, the humidity used in indoor grows. It's a big problem, and I found nine pesticides that were not tested by any state that were found in cannabis products. And so you might want to cross-check that one too. I'll, I'll send you my poster. Please don't share it with anybody because it hasn't been published anywhere because it was suppressed by the state of New Jersey. Don't ask me why it was. <laughs> so just looking at the action limits, this is, I'm assuming these are your action limits for hemp as well. Yes. The only one, um, speaking of, Amazo nil, I never can pronounce them correctly because they're always driving me. You have 0.04, and a lot of the other states have 0.2. Do you have any problem getting down to 0.04 in labs? No. Okay. No, no. And Man. why is that so low, just because of that concern? Yes, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the thing is, um, the inch, we're using LC or GC mass specs generally for the pesticide work, and we can see sub parts per trillion generally. Okay. I work. know on the HBLC, but I didn't think on the GCMS. Yeah. But they are getting better and better, so I mean, 
<laughs> I don't know. I could be on yeah, no, I mean, Our lab can generally is looking at residue levels from drift. Okay. So where, you know, and it's, it's small particles that do drift. We look very, very low. Um, <clears throat> I'd have to figure out, I'd have to go back to my notes and figure out why we made that decision. Um, if it is on the mycobutanol, it is because the other states were using a tolerance, an ingestion tolerance, and California is doing some of the pyrolysis work for inhalation. Yeah. And I saw some of the early numbers coming out of there. And I think that is why that number is low. It's okay. not a good published. Amisa. Okay, this one is not, oh, so is Amiza nil. I M A Z I A L I L. Yeah, that that's 0 0.04. Chlorpyrifos, I can understand, but I didn't know there was as much work on that, that other one. And then the amidochloropyrid. You know, your level is so much higher than most states. Why was that? The human toxicity is very low on the neonicotinoids. Okay. Because um, you were at 5 ppm, and I noticed yeah. that a lot of the other states are at 0.4. Right. And again, back to the inhalation studies, This is the neonicotinoids are sort of synthetic nicotine type compounds yeah and there's very very low human toxicity very toxic to bugs but very low i mean very correct high or low in terms of toxicity i think has the reverse the inverse relationship yeah. okay And, and also, is that true for your residual solvents? Not many pentanes are used and only the ones listed. I haven't looked at what the product tables are saying in this state. Yeah, and that's basically, we are in the hemp program, we don't allow hydrocarbon extraction, um, but there are some after extraction processing steps that do use hydrocarbon solvents. Um, yeah. That's why those those numbers exist there. But no pentanes and no so or the butanes aren't on there. Correct. And because there should be there should be none. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. We, if, I don't know if we, if the state will allow hydrocarbon extraction of high THC cannabis, and if if so, then the butane should be on there. Okay, so should we make that recommendation that maybe, or the yeah, at least the butanes. Mm -hmm. I imagine. Even if they're not allowed, we should probably check because they're the most common. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, maybe it seems to me that most of the processors are either using CO2, butane, or ethanol yeah. for their extractions. And by stat, I, you know, I can't remember all the statutes for all the different states, but I mean, Vermont is going to allow processors or currently here, and, and then you're going to allow the different methodologies to extract or concentrate, I mean. Yeah. We may want to add that, because although it seems, the note seems interesting, any solvent not permitted for extraction in the hemp pool, and then may be permitted in the, in the recreational rule. Yep. Anyway, those were only my thoughts on those tables, but other than that, I had no questions about them. I, I haven't seen the tables, and I just wanted to 
ensure that, unless I missed it somewhere, um, um, to ensure I understood you, Carrie, concerning the microbial the recommendations that you made. You, so my recommendation. You said something about the hemp. Yeah, my recommendations would be that the control board use the levels that you've established, because our levels were were gleaned from other states, and they didn't necessarily do the health impact study that you've sort of taken the time to do. Our, I, I guess what I'm saying is our numbers are based on what other states were using, and those numbers, the other states were using were based on what they could see and setting an arbitrary threshold. Um, yours are far less arbitrary and I think more useful. Right, I, I've watched the industry try state by state to make, you know, uh, to make regulations require microbial testing all the way back to 19, I mean, 2012. Mm -hmm. And everyone started with a table that was published in the monograph in which the monograph and footnote says, we do not intend these recommendations that we simply glean from various organizations throughout the world as that you should just use for cannabis because of the unusual matrix but all the states started doing that and it was pipe piper effect and then many people or many regulators thought that well let's just take cannabis it, oh it's a food so yeah. let's just start borrowing it from the usp you know a pharmaceutical or a food was like follow the leader on that route and then I being a scientist I, I wanted to comb the literature and, and look at some states that did the same thing and find the pathogens that actually impacted um, cannabis users and the fact that a phenomena is occurring amongst the early states that have formed various task force and subcommittees to relook or re-examine their microbial testing and they, they're like circling back and adding these pathogens and, and doing it correctly. I see too many states that just arbitrarily say pathogenic E. coli without thinking it through. There's six different types of pathogenic E. coli and there's not a single test that can detect all six of them. And you've got to go with the most toxic one I mean, pathogenic one, which I checked with the laboratory director, who is an MD, at, at our, where I used to work in New Jersey. He totally agreed from a clinical viewpoint of picking, you know, stack E. coli and salmonella is, these are for sanitary purposes. And then the aspergillus, there's, it's in the literature, it's killed people. Mm -hmm. Oh, in Florida, I just want to mention in Florida, an unnamed multi-state operator producing uh, cannabis flower released product into the Florida medical cannabis industry that was contaminated with one of the aspergillus pathogens. So you have, and I, I'm trying to track down whether a lab gave a false negative or this organization simply tried to slip it through. Mm -hmm. You've got to be real watchful. Yeah. So, so that I'm, I know you guys are referring to table five and what was, what were some of the action limits? I didn't see those action limits proposed, Carrie, for, for the trim. Is it all, all different or what, what are we looking at? Yeah, they're not um, proposed other than we've gone back and forth um, on that well, level. Yeah. Well, um, are we sp speaking about cell stack and the four astrogillus pathogens, or are we speaking about something else? Something else. We hadn't. OK. Oh, the, OK. The human pathogens we hadn't um, considered. Um, the, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you know you're in a compost tea or a, a live manure or some processor is unsanitary. Um, we hadn't really got there. We, we were focusing on mycotoxins that were oh yeah from botrytis or 
aspergillus type. Um, that was, was our thought and our focus, but you've included the human pathogens that we didn't, we weren't thinking about at all. Well, the thing is, is that one of the interesting pieces of literature I came across is that a lot of people may surmise that through um, burning or vaporizing uh, cannabis, um, that spores are destroyed. They're not. I have peer-reviewed literature that shows that spores survive that process. And they're inhaled, and you have some individuals that are immunocompromised. Um, and I even found one piece of, or one peer-reviewed literature that showed that somebody that worked at a dispensary in Southern, I mean, Bakersfield, California, which is in the Big Valley, he was not immunocompromised, and he was infected uh, in the lung with um, another fungi. I forget which one. So, um, but anyway, so. Did he live? <laughs> I, I don't I'm, remember. I mean, this is. Okay. I wish I could. You can Get see. You know, you can see my white hair here. My memory is just not as good. I'd have to look into that one. Um, so, so what I hear you saying is that there's some added testing not, that would be the parameters for the cannabis side of things to this right. table five. Well, I'm a proponent of what what I simply, I guess, my cliche is the California model is that ever since they had medical and now they have both medical and adult use is that they've championed the um, the list pest, the testing of just these six human pathogens and they're sticking to that and other states have done the same uh, I believe Alaska has done that my trustee table is a little dated. It goes back to 2019 because I had to shut everything down and shift all my efforts towards COVID-19. The last 18 months I was with the Department of Health in New Jersey. But uh, let's see. Okay. But, um, all right, we'll go forward that on, so I'll see what those are. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I, I remember looking at the Vermont hemp microbial testing and it had uh let's say total aerobic and total yeast and mold yeah um various types of products um mycotoxin total of a flac toxin b1 b2 g1 oh, i see those are the mycotoxins and then um or orcotoxin a or Right. Those are the one, two, three, four. Those represent the mycotoxins or aflatoxins that do, uh, that are carcinogenous or otherwise impact humans. They may not necessarily be the correct ones. Some of them only grow on grain. Um, right. But it was a very fairly easy suite to analyze for in the lab, so we kept them all. Right, that's what seems like everyone else is. That's what we started with back in 2012. Yeah, we're with the help, help of DOA. Um, but I guess what I'm asking, Carrie, is this um, so you're recommending this total aerobic and total yeast and mold is what you have for him? So, um, Sherwood, I, I really appreciate the work you've done, and I'm almost. I, I, looking for your expertise to, to guide us there. Um, my sort of expertise is the pesticide side and heavy right. metal, and I'm very much, we lack right. well, expertise. Same that, here. That, well, the, the, uh, I keep saying the same thing to many regulators you know, all over the country is that, is that whatever action level you have for any total count, like what you have for the hemp, you know, total aerobic or total yeast and mold, is that a 
commercial laboratory that has been licensed by the state of Vermont will perform some kind of test. And let's say the action level is above your action level, then there's going to be a consequence to mm -hmm. that grower, either remediation, um, I mean, diverting that batch to <coughs> concentrate and test it, or remediating the dried, cured cannabis and retesting, or destroying the crop. And maybe I'm too simplistic, but I keep saying to myself as a scientist, I really didn't get any information from the commercial laboratory that the batch sample that was tested had any um, deleterious human pathogens in the sample. So I'm, I'm not a proponent of total count. Mm -hmm. As you know, and, 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 and the original monograph that has been read by so many cannabis regulators, which is that American Herbal Pharmacopeia published in 2014, um, indicates that, you know, if you read, read that section, it says that total counts should not be utilized to fail a batch and no one seems to have read that part and they're they're in the process i've had communications with them and then they're in the process of rewriting and coming out with a new edition that they've asked me to write the microbial section but at the time i was busy with COVID 19. Um, but there are differences of opinion by many um, state regulators throughout the country but that's the only thing that makes sense to me and others at medicinal genomics is to, you know, is to start with that, with the mm -hmm. peer reviewed literature. The ideal thing is something that I don't think will ever happen. And I may have mentioned that in the previous meeting, and I'll just briefly summarize by saying it would be the most ideal thing is to get samples to be tested. It's called microbiome whole genome sequence. Mm -hmm. Cannabis samples from all over the country. And to collect all of that information and identify truly what are the pathogens found that is grown in cannabis throughout the United States of America. Then one can then, then those are the ones that should be looked at. No. But that's never gonna happen. That is a major project that could be funded by the federal government or something like that. We're talking lots of money, but I think the ideal at the same time. But we start with the peer reviewed literature and then monitor that literature and add more human pathogens as more and more information comes out. But that's why I start with these six. Um, because the in Oklahoma, for example, because I attend many meetings throughout the country and listen, and in, in Oklahoma, they, they, they had some problems with salmonella, for example. And where did it come from? It's a little funny, you know. Um, the grower let his pet iguana freely roam in his indoor grow. Oh, wow. So it's that kind of thing. It, yeah, everybody's thinking that people aren't washing their hands and that they handle the cannabis uh, in, inside the grow, but it could be from other reasons, perhaps. But I, I'm sure that Vermont is going to have a much better regulated industry than Oklahoma, which is the most out of hand. They have 13,000 licensees. They have no caps for growers. Wow. There's 13,000 and only 31 teams of inspectors. It's it's a um, horrifying situation they have there. I can imagine. I know how they are in regular pesticide right. work. <laughs> so that's, that's what I recommend. I don't really recommend anything else. I, I can get behind that. 
I don't know if those are my reasons. Um, I, I, you know, I, you know, the thing also in terms of the accuracy, even when you try to do, you know, total counts, um, many laboratories end up using auger plating techniques one has to really examine this cannabis matrix. And again, I go to the peer-reviewed literature is that there's multiple publications that indicate that the different cannabinoids are antibiotic, have antibiotic properties. So you homogenize the cannabis sample and then you plate directly on an agar medium. And well, you have some of those cannabinoids that you've put in on the plate and so you have some antibiotic you know you're going to get lower counts uh, you know people don't think about that also the human pathogens that have killed people they're endophytes it's another thing it, these cells live inside the plant cells and so plating is never going to um, identify those human pathogens, the aspergillus, and even the enterics like Salmonella, E. coli. I can provide you with peer-reviewed literature that shows they have been found inside plant cells. This is some literature that's just coming out the last few years. The mechanisms have not been identified yet. Um, and again, that's why, you know, I, I've had a five-year, decade-long career microbiology besides my graduate degree being in microbiology and I've I started plating on auger plates as a sophomore in college and I've been through the PCR and I've been through whole genome sequencing and I was the subject matter expert for the state of New Jersey and that was a recommendation I gave to the medical cannabis program that was accepted but as soon as I disappeared from the scene <laughs> they've gone into another direction but that's up to that regulatory commission that I hope to that they'll see the light in the end um, so that's you know I've you know I think the I think what I sent you Gary was my last modification with all the peer-reviewed literature and everything yeah, very good so so are you thinking of adding what he listed there as the aspergillus pathogens and the simonella species and the toxin producing e coli i do think that makes a lot of sense him okay. um like i said we're we're getting invaluable um input from from an expert to, and this is out of my depth. I'm, you know, yeah, like like I, I I deal, yeah. The only place I deal with mycotoxins is the feed regulatory program, and that's <laughs> that's why you see what you're seeing on the cannabis side. Um, drawing on expertise from one of my other program or you know standards mm -hmm. from one of my other programs, but we have we have a strong recommendation from a depth of knowledge that. Uh, I don't have, and I, I think we do use your SOPs, the outline that the hemp program has developed with the modification on the um, pathogen side of exactly what Sherman has proposed. Nice. And, and also, I, I, I thought I, the original, the original consultant Maybe that was mentioned in the last meeting. The original consultant for the state of Vermont, when it was only a medical cannabis program, I found some document that was provided to the state of Vermont back a few years that recommended exactly what I recommended. And I think I shared that with that with someone in the state. I, I can dig that up too. Carrie, I think Stephanie. I, I think Stephanie had had mentioned that she was aware of the document that Sherman was referring to. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen that document though. 
Right. I'll this uh, that, that document that uh, NSL put together. That was another one of um, Monique um, McHenry and I'm, his name just slipped my mind. Um, but they were one of our dispensaries and did put together a document years ago. Oh, I see. I thought it was an independent consultant. It was. It was a dispensary. One of oh. our dispensaries. Oh, but okay. the, currently, the, the dispensaries, there is no consumer protection component to the medical program at all. Right. Yeah. Well, that occurred in other states until it was legislated. Like Arizona didn't have any protection for consumers for upwards of seven or eight years and it was finally legislated and then they had a big fight there between the relators and the industry and so forth and so on and then they came out with some testing regulations yeah so Right, and so those are, you know, I put all my thoughts in those words, and um, mm -hmm. I don't really have that much more to add. And I, I've counted as many, I think now 12 states that have, like, uh, either began with or circled back and are adding these pathogens. And more and more states are automatically adding well, salmonella has never been a problem. Everybody knows that every species of salmonella that exists on the earth is, is pathogenic. Um, but for E. coli, <laughs> I gotta laugh, I'm sorry. I see regulations that see, just simply say E. coli and with an action level of less than one. And anybody can go into Wikipedia under E. coli and see that not all E. coli are pathogenic. So you might detect a non-pathogenic E. coli and have a consequence on a grower. Mm. It's a bad state of affairs. Yeah. I just want to, that's why I've been, I, I was hired by MGC. I wanted to do this as a government official, but I was never allowed to. And now I simply communicate with every state that I can communicate with and try to bring science uh, into their programs. That's always been what I've known, you know, serving the public for 20 years in public health. That I want to protect the consumers and the patients. That is what I live for. I think your timing was perfect for interaction, interacting with Ramon, and really appreciate the, everything you're, you're offering. Well, you're most welcome. I also want to say to you, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to share with what I do know, because not every state uh, is as welcoming. Mm. That's just the facts. I think Vermont cares a lot about public input so um, across the state. So There are some very opinionated regulators, even scientific subject matter experts that entered the cannabis field without humility. I don't know anything about cannabis in December 2011 when I was asked to be the program man project manager to start the first cannabis testing lab. I didn't know a thing. And I've learned one thing in my scientific career, and that is to go into the literature and keep my mouth shut and learn. And I've been learning for almost 10 years. And I continue to learn as I learn from experts in pesticides and metals and so forth and so on. And, um, and the cannabinoids, too. Mm -hmm. I have one pet peeve about states that put in their rules what cannabinoids must be tested for, and of course there's the big four, but I hate it when they list the neutral form without listing the acid form, because greater than 90% of the cannabinoids stored in trichomes are in the acid form, 
cannabinoids are quantitatively determined utilizing HPLC, which is performed at room temperature, and is not going to convert any of the acid forms into the neutral forms. And I see regulators making that error because they're copying each other. But that's not my purview. I have to focus on, on the microbial testing. That's one thing that I have to do. But when I do have the opportunity, one on one, I do mention it. That is something that we've been aware of all along. So as we, yeah. <laughs> not everybody is, Carrie. Not everybody. Yeah. So, Carrie, and, and it, go ahead, Carrie. No, go ahead. I was going to say, do we want to, I'm trying to find a natural conclusion to, to the substantive conversation here, and I'm, I'm way out of my element because I don't have the expertise that the three of you have when it comes to determining these action limits for, for various, um, you know, various pesticides and, and other um, microbials and stuff like that that are on all these tables. I'm trying to find a logical ending to talking about procedure as it relates to getting a, a tangible document to the full board and, and how might that look and, and timing and so on and so forth. So, um, it, it, but if you had a more substantive comment, Carrie, before that, um, feel free to go. I, I don't, Kyle. Um, you and the board and we collectively all, we have all the pieces. We just haven't put them together in a recommendation to you. Yeah, that, that's what I was wondering too. Is it, um, I'm wondering how you wanna go about that. I certainly recognize that there is, that, that the information is all there. The, 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 the puzzle or Lego set just needs to be put, put together and, and delivered. Um, so I wanted to talk about how, what, what works considering that this is supplemental to your you know, day jobs. Um, I don't want to overly burden either one of you, but who might be best positioned to, to get a draft of all this together? And does it make sense to have another meeting next Wednesday to talk about that draft and get its final approval from the two of you and square up any loose ends? Or do you think that can be done via email? I think the goal is hopefully um, I can take some of this conversation to our board meeting next Friday and make sure that the board um, examines the proposal and, and, and raises any concerns um, so that hopefully, and I see David's watching, we're, we're trying to get certain rules um, pre-filed um, before the end of the month. So um, I just want to be conscious of, of time and for the folks listening or for the folks in the room, um, there will be many more comment periods down the road. So even if, if the board does recommend that we take the subcommittee's work next Friday, there will be multiple times to express differing opinions when it comes to, um, you know, these action limits and, and allowables and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, Kyle, what I am going to recommend that the board do is a, adopt a framework similar to what's in statute in Title VI about the Cannabis Quality Control Program and what to test and then the um, action levels and um, what, like the list of pesticides, um, be done via either rule or procedure. So the board can modify them without going through um, right. changing legislation. And what those procedures so you can go ahead with a proposed rule um, and then have in your uh, folder or back pocket if you will uh, the outline that we're proposing and that's that the the um, Vermont adopt the SOPs and procedures that uh, Kim developed for Oregon um, and as far as taking a sample and getting those samples to the lab, I'd even propose that the board hire Kim to do training of field inspectors. And the criteria that gets tested for is what's outlined in the hemp program 
with the modification of throwing away what's in there completely that we have for mycotoxins and substituting what Sherman has proposed as the most appropriate um, human pathogens or pathogens to be tested for in cannabis, the, the six, if you will. Right, and, and the action levels for that is non, it's non-detected. Basically, yeah, it's presence, absence. It's um, that is always the action level in all states that have adopted testing of any of those six um, human pathogens. Always non detected. So, Kerry and Kim, can we get that kind of all packaged into one document, including the SOPs and and so on and so forth, by like next Wednesday? Is that is that a timeline that might work? Um, a couple of weeks ago, I uh, kind of like volunteered to do that. Um, some of the stuff has gotten lost in my email, but I have a uh, Sherman's document. Kim, I'm, I apologize <laughs> for asking, but can you resend me those SOPs and I'll put it all together in one document by the end of the week? That would be fantastic. Kim, you're muted. You Sorry, yeah, I was, um, so what I, what I uh, hear is you're going to take, you general, need to take the whole specifically. No, act no time, and okay. reproduce it with the words, um, or what, what are you actually proposing that you have to do? Because I looked at these tables and this is pretty much the testing and the action limits. Um, with the modifications that we've talked about today, what else do you have to produce for them? Just the whole rule or what what it, what do you have to do, Carrie? I'm like, I feel bad. <laughs> yeah. I don't. I don't. And it, it, as far as the rule goes, Kim, I'll send you a copy of the statute. Okay, I have that, I think. Yeah, that I think that's what they need to do. Okay. It's what to test for, but not when to test for it. It's okay. just, it basically says that the, it, the Cannabis Control Board would take the Cannabis Quality Control Program language from Title VI. Okay. Um, so that's all they need for rule. And then the um, action limits and all that would be done by procedure, so if a new if new chemistry shows up, they can add it to the list. Right. Um, I, or, yeah. or remove old chemistry without having to go to the legislature. That's the best way to do it. <laughs> okay. So then you're gonna do that by the end of this week. Do you wanna, or next week? Yeah, no, I'm gonna do it uh, probably Friday. Okay. I've got a, a 9.30 meeting and then a whole until noon. So from 9.30 to noon, I can work on that. Should we tentatively just schedule a meeting and hold it on your calendars for next Wednesday in case we need to clear up any loose ends? And if it's not needed and those edits can be done via email, you know, we can we can cross that bridge when we get there. Do you want to, were you going to set up another um, standard operating procedure with like Vermont's information? And because I think you guys had a little bit different um, incremental sampling when I looked on the, um, the website, but were, were you just going to set up an, an SOP or use the generic one from Oregon, or how do you want to do that? Um, I either way works. I'm okay. willing to use the generic one from Oregon and just let the board map their modifications. Yeah. Okay. How about is that? Does that work? That works for you. Yeah, that yeah. that that is an open document that they made free to everybody. It's been on their website for ages. Excellent. Okay, well, um, I'm talking with Nellie. We might have a. Okay, 
she says no board meeting next Wednesday. Okay. So Great. does so um, does Wednesday at noon again to put on your calendars and hold that um, for the seventeenth. Um, work. I'm trying to think. I'm actually going to be away. Um, and if I have to take someone to the airport, I may not be available or I'll have to, I can call in from, I'll let you know if I can call Kyle, in or not. Kyle, since it's just two of us and we've already expressed to the board what our um, intent is, I think we can accomplish, Kim and I can accomplish this um, and keep Sherman involved as well uh, to make sure we don't screw up his his addition. Okay. Um, we can accomplish this over email, and I'll email include uh, everyone on on this invite um, on the email I send out Friday, and we can go from there. So you officially have a proposal from from us. Um, but don't have it in writing yet. And I, I think we can tackle it via email. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds good. And I can follow up with you, Carrie, um, as needed as well. But um, appreciate everybody's time here today. I think we're getting getting pretty close to, you know, to moving on to the next phase. Last call for public comment. Yeah, I'll be back. Okay. I'll be back for the following Wednesday okay. if you choose to. I saw David. Just in, great. Yeah. I saw David just jump in really quick. David, you have the floor. Real quick, Carrie, if you can just keep me on those emails as I'm trying to put this into real language, that'll be super helpful. Excellent. Thank, thanks, David. We'll Thank do. you. All right. Well, we can end this a little bit early. 12:54. Thank you, everybody. Six looking All forward right. to some. Thank looking you. forward to Friday. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Everybody have a great week. Bye.